We are not designed to live in a world at war. We know this in our very core, don't we? And scripture gives us the most robust framework that any faith or philosophy can give us when we grapple with this disconnect that we experience. Again and again, I read scripture and it precisely and profoundly describes my lived experience. It shouldn't surprise me then when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the one source of truth for this world. We need to hold him out to others. Now, this concept of peace is not confined to the absence of conflicts, as I've said, uh, but extends to the presence of the Holy Spirit's work to bring about fullness and harmony. We observe shalom in action when we see adversaries reconciled, such as Jacob and Esau's heartfelt reunion, or when Joseph uh, graciously forgave his brothers. When rival kingdoms made peace in the Bible, It wasn't just about them stopping the fighting. It was about working together in the aftermath. In the book of Ruth, we see Shalom, where Ruth's loyalty to Naomi brings her out peace and security to her mother-in-law's life. And ultimately, it leads to the restoration of the family line. Incredible. King David's Psalms frequently invoke the theme of peace as he yearns for God's Shalom amidst turmoil and conflict. Psalm 34, verse 14 is a good example of this. Uh, Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. It's a call to actively pursue peace as a virtue. Uh, Jesus' birth in the New Testament was announced as the arrival of peace. Luke chapter two, I know we're not at Christmas yet. My little fact for the day, I've said this to a few people already. Um, My wife loves Christmas and... uh, Two months ago, we were readying ourselves for Christmas. Some of you aren't ready to hear this. Two months ago, we were pretty much in the full swing, right? And two months, the sixth of the year. So we're a sixth of the way already to Christmas. I'm just, I, I, so, I, sorry. I just, there we go. Luke chapter two reads, uh, and there were shepherds living out in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David has been born a savior. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great cloud of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Peace. Jesus emerges as the very embodiment of peace. The Prince of Peace prophesied in Isaiah. His teachings and actions consistently reveal a dedication to cultivating peace in individuals and communities. The Beatitudes extend blessings of peace to those who are meek and pure in heart, promising us comfort and communion with God. His miracles, parables, and personal interactions often culminated in restoration of peace, whether it was calming of storms, healing ailments, or encouraging the downtrodden. On his return to heaven, uh, remember Jesus has always existed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there has always been a beautiful, eternal, peaceful relationship with one another. So they know what they're talking about. Uh, On Jesus' return to heaven, he sent us his Holy Spirit, who is our comforter. The Holy Spirit works within our hearts to bring about peace. The presence of the Holy Spirit is transformative. He guides us and our church community towards a life marked with fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Apostle Paul's letters also contribute to our understanding of peace, as he encourages the Ephesians to maintain the unity through the Spirit in the bond of peace. Paul writes, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. 
There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. He makes every effort, he asks us to make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. We see here that peace is not just a passive state as I've already mentioned. It's the Holy Spirit enabling us for acts that unite us and reconcile us within the body of Christ. And finally, on our whistle-stop tour uh, of peace in the Bible, we end up in Revelation 21. This is maybe one of my uh, treasured sections of Scripture, looking towards what's to come. And it reads this, Then I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away. I'm just going to pause there. Uh, The eternal space that we go to with God uh, is a new heaven and new earth. And you've heard this and you've read this in scripture. Uh, It's not floating on cloud type moment. Uh, We're inhabiting a new earth uh, and there's going to be things to do there. Maybe we'll invent things. Maybe we'll farm. Maybe we'll eat. Maybe we'll play sport. We don't know exactly, but it's going to be an incredible space that we're going to be in. And that's something to look forward to. Revelation 21 goes on to say, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain the old order of things has passed away. This peace is coming. I want us to spend uh, the final few minutes looking at the three dimensions of peace that I mentioned, uh, relational, societal, and finally, personal. Uh, We can look at the parable of the prodigal son in terms of relational peace. We're very familiar with it. And the narrative itself looks at Father God, uh, and it looks at us as sons, and looks at the way that we've rebelled against God, and God opens his arms to us to welcome us back in. Uh, But there's a simpler way to look at it, and it's a breakdown of a family bond. It's a breakdown there that we read about of a father-son relationship. And I wonder, when we think about that, who here as a father or a parent has felt dishonored, dismissed, or worse by a son or child of your own? Who here has a son or child? Who here has a, who here as a son or child has dishonored, dismissed, or done worse to a dad or a parent? things to reflect on. The relational breakdown within the family unit is a real issue in our families. The enemy would love to break down and destroy family units. 